First of all, can everyone hear? Is this working? Yeah? Thumbs up in the back. Can you all hear? Great. Uh, well, let me begin by apologizing for speaking to you sort of ex cathedra like this. It's really only a look that the Pope should try to pull off. Uh, but, but I do have a legitimate excuse. Uh, last Sunday, you may have noticed, uh, me and a million of my closest friends uh, celebrated this double play canonization uh, of Popes John the 23rd and John Paul II. Uh, I was making my way to the CNN viewing platform, which was uh, at the end of the Via della Conciliazione, that's that broad street that leads up to St. Peter's Basilica, I, through the sea of humanity, trying to get to where I needed to be. Uh, and there was this beefy 300-pound, pumped-up John the 23rd devotee from Bergamo someplace <laughs> who was carrying an ice box full of soda pop for, for his clan uh, who got stuck right in front of me and took a wrong step and brought himself and his ice box right down on my right foot. So, uh, and I'm still dealing with that. I'm hoping that CNN will approve combat pay. It's, it's got a bureaucracy that makes the Vatican look like a well-oiled machine. So we'll see how this plays out. B by the way, if any of you watched that broadcast and I seemed incoherent to you, that may be why. Uh, I, I did this whole thing in exquisite agony with my foot propped up on a TV camera box. So, you know, survival was always looking for coherence as kind of second order thing. Uh, but in any event, that's why I'm doing this sort of cash here tonight. Uh, listen, it is, uh, it is a delight uh, to be with you. It's great to be in the market for the newspaper I now write for, the Boston Globe. Uh, I'm sure you picked up from my accent. I am not a Bostonian, so I'm still trying to pick up the lingo and the customs of the peculiar tribe that seems to move around up here. Uh, would, how about those Bruins last night? Did you remember what you so you see, I'm on a learning curve, but, uh, but you know, uh, it's, it's great to, to be with you. It's great, obviously, to be talking about such a fascinating subject uh, as the tsunami uh, in Catholic life that we have lived through over what is now almost 15 months since March 13th, 2013, uh, when Jorge Mario Bergoglio of Buenos Aires in Argentina stepped out on the balcony overlooking St. Peter's Square as the new Pope of the Catholic Church. Now, you know, when the conversation turns to Pope Francis, the temptation, particularly for a guy like me, uh, is to do nothing other than just tell you Francis' stories, because they are already legion and they are all terrific. Uh, but I feel like I owe you something slightly more reflective than that. So let me tell you what my game plan here tonight is going to be. I'm going to start first with a couple of different ways of taking the temperature of the Francis effect, that is, vignettes that illustrate the sort of mesmerizing fashion uh, in which this new pope is sort of captured the imagination of the world. Then I'm going to shift gears and lay out for you what I see as three emerging pillars of the Francis Revolution. That is, three areas where this pope's interest seems to be the most acute, and therefore over time where his impact is likely to be the greatest. Then I'll talk a little bit about reaction to Pope Francis and sort of what we do with that. Uh, and then we'll bring the plane in for a landing, uh, take a quick break, and then we'll come back and see what you all want to talk about. Okay? So let's begin with three different ways of taking the temperature of the Francis effect. Okay, let's talk first about this Pope's popularity. Now, there are a lot of different ways we can illustrate the way he has become sort of the rock star par excellence of, of the early 21st century. I mean, for example, do you know that Pope Francis just broke the 12 million barrier in terms of his following on Twitter? Now, this makes him by far the most followed religious and spiritual leader in the Twitter universe, though not quite yet the most followed human being. Do you all know who the most followed human being on Twitter actually is? Just give me a name. What do you think? Justin Bieber. Yeah, Bieber is usually what I get. Bieber is actually in second place. The single most followed human being on Twitter, ladies and gentlemen, is Lady Gaga. <laughs> and you know, surely the apocalypse cannot be far behind, right? <laughs> but I mean, give the Pope a break. He's only been on Twitter 14 months, you know, so 12 million is not bad. Or, uh, if Twitter doesn't do it for you, we could talk about his poll numbers. Okay, it is a fact. Not a hunch, not a theory, not a kind of gut level impression. It is a hardcore, empirical, take it to the bank fact. 
that in every corner of the world in which public opinion can be scientifically measured, this pope has poll numbers that politicians and celebrities would sacrifice their children to pagan gods to obtain. For example, the network I work for, CNN, recently did a survey that found that Pope Francis has an almost 90%, okay, that's 9-0, 90% approval rating among American Catholics. Now, sit with that number for a minute and put it next to what all of us in this church know about how badly divided American Catholics typically are about everything. I mean, the truth of it is, under ordinary circumstances, it would be tough to get 90% of American Catholics to agree that today is Sunday. <laughs> and in that context, this number is nothing short of flabbergasting. And frankly, if we ever get around to beatifying and canonizing Jorge Mario Bergoglio, this could probably count as his first miracle. Uh, I mean, it's, it's a mind-bending number. But none of that, none of those statistical measures uh, is the illustration I want to put before you in terms of the Pope's popularity. Instead, I want to tell you a quick story from his trip to Brazil in July for World Youth Day. Uh, you may know this is a trip that was originally planned for Benedict XVI, but then uh, Pope Francis confirmed that he would go uh, when he was elected. So he was in Brazil from the 20th to the 28th of July, most of his time in Rio. That trip reached its crescendo uh, at the end when on two separate occasions, for the Saturday evening youth vigil and for the Sunday morning concluding mass, so twice, Pope Francis drew, drew crowds in excess of three million people to Rio de Janeiro's Copacabana Beach, the world's most famous stretch of sand and surf. That, by the way, broke the previous attendance record uh, at Copacabana held by, wait for it, the Rolling Stones. Okay, this is how you know you've arrived on the cultural landscape. I personally was thrilled with that turnout because it allowed me to write a lead for my rap story on the trip that began for one hallowed weekend at Copacabana Beach. Bikinis and rosaries coexisted in glorious harmony, <laughs> welcoming the pontiff to Brazil. <clears throat> but that's not even the story I want to tell you. The story I want to tell you actually comes from Thursday uh, of World Youth Day week. Uh, now, on that day, Francis had decided he wanted to go to the cathedral uh, in downtown Rio to greet the Argentinian youth who were in town for this event. So this was ostensibly for the Argentines, but of course, when word got out that the Pope was going, everybody else showed up too, so it was kind of a mob scene. I was in the press bus right behind the Pope. We pulled into this area around the cathedral that was supposed to be cordoned off, right? It was supposed to be a secure zone. But there was this group of Latin American nuns that somehow had wormed their way into this space. So when the door to the Pope Mobile opens, they rush him shrieking like teenage girls at a Justin Bieber concert. I mean, it was complete madness. Now, the Brazilians had theoretically deployed like 20,000 troops and cops and security personnel, you know, to prevent this kind of thing from happening. So I pulled one of them aside and I said, hey, what's going on? Why didn't you get in the way? Why didn't you do something? And this guy said, look at me, man. I've got a combat helmet on my head. I've got ammo strapped across my chest. I am not going to be the guy caught on YouTube beating up a nun. <laughs> it's just not going to happen. Well, that, ladies and gentlemen, was the spirit of those days. There was a kind of electricity and an affirmment around this man that was so palpable that any attempt to kind of fence it in and bottle it up was, was sort of destined to fail. Huh? All right, so that's the Pope's popular appeal. Then let's talk briefly about his media appeal. I speak now as a media professional. I don't think there is any serious doubt that Francis has become the new media icon, uh, the, the, the new sort of towering source of moral authority on the global stage. In many ways, I think you could make the argument that Francis is the new Nelson Mandela. Uh, in the way in the media business, he now stands for a kind of unquestioned street credibility. Uh, as a moral leader, that means where he stands marks out which side the angels are on. You know, lots of different ways we could illustrate that. There is a media foundation in Europe, for example, that found that the word that Pope Francis 
was the single most Googled human being in all of calendar 2013. And bear in mind, he wasn't elected pope until the middle of March, which meant that every other human being on the planet had a two and a half month head start, okay? And he still finished in first place. Or we could tick off all the magazine covers he's been on, you know? I mean, the fact that he was Time's person in the year, that he was on the Advocate, that he was, I mean, for God's sakes, the cover of the Rolling Stone. Uh, and yes, I did buy five copies for my mother, by the way. <laughs> no, that's a dated reference, but I know some of you did. Uh, my favorite example, however, of the way he has become a, a new media darling is this. Do you know that Time was not actually the first magazine to declare Francis as person of the year? Do you know what the first one was? It was the Italian edition of Vanity Fair. Vanity Fair, ladies and gentlemen, okay? This is not a diocesan newspaper out there someplace. Okay, not an organ that historically has been a lapdog of the Catholic Church. Oh, and by the way, their write-up included a tribute from that well-known Vatican expert, Elton John, uh, who described Francis as, quote, an, a miracle of humility in an era of vanity. Miracle of humility in an era of vanity. It's a great line. I'm actually waiting for the world to forget that Elton John said it so I can steal it. <laughs> but here's the remarkable thing. The remarkable thing is that they made this declaration in June. Now, bear in mind, Vanity Fair, like every other magazine in the world, typically brings out its person of the year issue in December, logically enough, at the end of the calendar year. But they decided that by June, they had seen enough from Francis that no other human being was going to surpass what he had done during that short arc of time. I mean, this was the media equivalent of the 10-run rule in American Little League Baseball. Okay, you all know this rule? that if we've got a Little League baseball game and one team gets more than 10 runs ahead of the other team, we figure they're embarrassing the competition, so we just call the game after the fourth inning. Well, that's basically what Vanity Fair did. They decided that Francis was embarrassing the competition, and so they called the contest in June. You will never need any further proof of the way in which he has captured the imagination of the media universe. Okay? Now look, it is fun to catalog all the ways in which the Pope has become a celebrity, but if we want to ask the deeper sort of evangelical and missionary question about this, it would really be that the Pope's celebrity creates a mammoth moment of missionary opportunity for the Catholic Church. Because the eyeballs of the world are on this Pope, the eyeballs of the world are now also on the church that he leads. And the $64,000 question is, now that they are looking at us, what are they going to see? Okay. Come back to that in a moment, but just have that in the back of your mind is, is one of the key questions uh, about the Francis era. Okay, what are we collectively going to do with the new missionary momentum that the kind of ferment around Francis in the wider world is generating? Okay? Let's shift gears for a moment and try to briefly outline what I see as three emerging pillars of the Francis papacy. And let me preface this with this. Precisely because the Pope has become such a beguiling and fascinating figure, well beyond the boundaries of the Catholic Church, there is, of course, a great deal of speculation and punditry and competing interpretation about who Francis really is and where he is taking the Catholic Church. I mean, even the Pope himself has expressed frustration with some of the competing narratives uh, that are out there. Uh, I, so, what I would submit to you is, I, I know it can be difficult to cut through the noise, to separate the wheat from the chaff, to, to determine what is actually reliable uh, in terms of the, the different ways that this pope is being framed. I would submit that if you understand the following three points about Francis, you will be in a position to make sense of about 95% of what you were seeing and hearing from this pope and his team. I mean, these, these really are his sort of get out of bed in the morning thinking about it core principles. 